Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the first episode of the Why Japan podcast with Michael Tang. Each podcast episode will focus on a new guest who lives in Japan, their experiences, and ultimately their story answering the question, Why Japan? I got the chance to have my good friend Marcel Oka, a Chinese Indonesian native who currently works at a recruiting company in Tokyo, be my first guest on the show. I met Marcel a few years back through some mutual friends. And thought he would be a great first guest on the show. We talk a little bit about what led him down this road, his experiences at a Japanese language school, and we learned a little bit about the recruiting industry here in Japan. It's my first ever podcast episode, and I hope to get better at this as I go on. I do have a few more guests lined up for the next few weeks, so please look forward to that. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with others. Without any further ado, here's my first ever Why Japan podcast episode. With my good friend Marcel. Welcome to the show, Marcel. How's it going? Thank you for having me. Everything's good. You know, it's a cloudy sun- Sunday afternoon, but yeah, it's a good day. Yeah, I think so too.、Um, I'm not leaving my apartment at all, so it feels pretty comfortable to, to stay inside and not have to be out in the humidity or, or the rain. So, for a lot of people who don't know you, Marcel, could you just kind of Give them a, a basic rundown on what you do and who you are. Okay, so、um, my name is Marcel, and I've been living in Japan for over four years now.、Um, I'm from Indonesia, by the way. So I used to live in Indonesia up until high school. So I was 19 years old, and I moved to Singapore for my university, and I decided to come to Japan around like four years ago. So, right now,、um, I'm a recruiter. So, basically, I help people, especially only engineers, actually,、um, in searching jobs in Japan, whether it's foreigner or、um, like、native Japanese speakers. How did you end up from where you were in Indonesia to Singapore to Japan? What was kind of like your, like I always say, origin story in, in choosing Japan or ending up in Japan? Okay, so it's actually quite interesting because, like, I feel like、um, myself, I don't have a like, clear reason why I choose Japan, but it's just happened. But、um, anyway, so when I was in Indonesia, so I have a brother and a sister. So when I was still in like a primary school, both of them decided to go to Singapore for their studies. So somehow my mom just decided to send them to Singapore while they're still like. Little boy and a little girl without any guidance at all, just like send them to Singapore. <laughs> so I was, yeah, so technically, in a sense, I was kind of like the only kid. When I graduated and nine, at nine years old, I was like, I was checking all these universities in Indonesia. And I mean, I'm not trying to say bad things about university in Indonesia, but it's just that I don't, they don't really have like a good,、um, how should I say,、uh, University major、okay. in Indonesia. Like、mm-hmm. most of my friends that went to universities, they're just like, I don't know what they're doing. They don't really go to universities. They just pretty right, much right. Just like、uh, late,、um, I don't know. They just go to school to just、um, show themselves and go back home and do nothing. So I was like, I should do something better. And so I decided to go to Singapore, which my、mm-hmm. mom s u p p o r t because my,、uh, my brother and my sister h a s been living there. And I moved to Singapore. Um, I stayed there for four years. I mean, you know, Singapore is a nice country, right? It's clean. It's、um, a very, how should I say, like a peaceful country. Right.、Um, what, what did you major in, by the way, when you were in Singapore? Oh, I'm major in Bachelor of Science. So I took programming. After you graduated,、uh, what, what kind of what was your next step? Right. So, so the next step is actually so when I finished my, high, my,、um, my university. I started to look for a job. At that time, I was still dating my ex、um, when I was in Singapore. So I started looking for a job and then it didn't work well. So basically,、um, in Singapore at that time, even now, it's very difficult for foreigners to find a job in Singapore.、Um, I actually got hired by the company, but my visa was rejected by the government. So, so your, your kind of career path ended right there, right then and there. Yeah. Yeah, in a sense. And I was, I think I was applying to like some IT company and becoming like an IT support or something. I can't remember. And also at that time, 
it's kind of shitty. I broke up with my ex at that exact times. So basically, like everything just crumbled down. I don't have a job. I broke with my ex. But on the positive side, like my life is fine. It's just on the on my career, on my and my like love. I feel like that's like two out of three. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like three. the two out of the three is like <laughs> not going well, right? You have your personal, your professional, and your love life, and two out of three just is not going the right direction. But at least personally, you're doing pretty good. So on on that side, yeah, it's fine. But from like my personal life, like I don't have any reason to be in Singapore anymore. I don't have a job. Right. I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> you have no and reason what? to be there. There's no. You finish your school and like. No matter how great Singapore is, like if you if you live there for like a year or two, there's nothing much you can do there. How did you end up in Japan from there? Like after the, you know, rejection of the job and your your <laughs> your, your love life kind of going down the drain, what made you know what was kind of the big step? Why Japan, right? Like why not any yeah. other country? So basically, my parents has a business, and then they told me to continue it, but I was like. I don't want to be in Indonesia, not yet. I don't want to spend my whole life in Indonesia yet. So I want to move to other country that I feel like I can grow as a person myself because I feel I felt like so I work a couple of like weeks with my parents. I felt like no matter what, I'm still their son, and the way they treat me in a company will be different. Just a couple, actually, just a couple of months before、um, I came to Japan, I watched this reality show called Gaki no Sukai. So they are the reason why I came to Japan. Like <laughs> they're the main reason. So Gaki no Tsukai is the name of the group, and this yearly show that they do is called Warate wa Ikenai. You cannot laugh twenty four hours. So that's the series. And then besides that, they do like the silent rivalry. But you're but, wait, but so you're telling me basically you had decided to come to Japan out of all countries just based off this show. Based on their show, I just felt like yeah. If if you could have watched any other show, you could have ended up in any other country. But this one show was kind of like, was like yeah. I guess I'll go to Japan. That's also that's kind of like the big part. But also there's like others extra stuff. For example, like I've studied like hiragana and katakana before. I mean, were you were you interested in like anime or manga as a child or? You、yes. know, interested in Japanese culture because it, that kind of seems to be the stem of a lot of people's. Relation and start to Japan is through pop culture, which is understandably, you, you know,、uh, I like. I think a lot of people are a little bit embarrassed about that, but you know, I mean, who, what kind of kid doesn't like anime or manga growing up? And some people go with it, and then some people don't. But what made you say, you know what, I'm just gonna move to Japan? Like I, I spoke, like I told you before, like、um, I feel like I don't want to like stay for a long time in Indonesia yet. This is literally what happened.、Um, I just so I was in the house. It was a fine day, and I just went to meet my mom. And I just basically asked her, like, "Hey, can I go to Japan?" <laughs> just like out of the blue, and then、uh-huh. she was like, "What the hell? Like, why? <laughs> like, why, why are you asking me this?" <laughs> I was just like, "Yeah, I just want to go to Japan. There's no clear reason why.、Um, I、mm-hmm. just felt like because Japan. I think like if you see it from like、um, a, like a Like a lifestyle point of view,、um, besides Singapore, Japan is like the safest country in Asia, and I don't feel like going to US because that's too far, especially Europe. You wanted something different, but not too out of the out of the scope of different, right? Yes. You didn't want、yep. a complete different. You just wanted something different. Yes, and like you said, like、um, I don't think you should feel like shy or anything.、Uh, I mean, like everyone loves anime.、Uh, yeah. We are that person who wakes up. In the morning on Sunday and get excited to watch anime for like hours, and we cried because we missed an episode, right? <laughs> so back in the day when new episodes came out once a week and you had to watch it at that time, and if you didn't, well, you missed it, and you had to you, wait for、yeah. the rerun in order to catch up. And you don't know when big important、yeah. day that you can't miss. Kind of miss a little bit of that. Yeah, I was pissed off at my mom that she didn't wake me up, and I missed an episode of Digimon. <laughs> I still remember that. <laughs> and you don't know when you're gonna watch it again. So yeah, that's basically happened. And yeah, I just decided to come to Japan because I feel like, in terms of culture, you know, like you get to see so many things that you are not able to see if you're a tourist in Japan. But, but th- that's different than living here or studying here, right? Right. Yeah, that's different because you get to dig deep about what Japan actually is like. Because Japan is so much more than just sushi, 
and Naruto and One Piece. Right? What? There's... What? I thought, I thought it was all of that. That's why I came to Germany. No. <laughs> but you're totally right. You know, you're totally right. And I yeah. think I don't know what's you know better or worse is that people come with that intention or not. Mm. You know, I mean, tourism is tourism, which is and, fine. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. It's... But it also feels as if you're kind of not getting. You're, you're kind of. It's like saying Americans are all about pizza and burgers, where you know right. there's so much deeper to Americans or even Indonesians, um, and basically every culture than you know their pop culture or their surface culture. But at this time, you were what twenty two. You, you don't speak Japanese. Do you, did did you speak any Japanese when you moved? I'm um, just a little bit. So before going to Japan, um, I applied through a language through a Japanese language school in Singapore. Then I told myself like, if I couldn't speak Japanese, it would be a hell. Because right. a year before that, I went to Japan with my friend. And that was amazing. It was an amazing trip, but no one speaks English at that time. Sure. It was like 2014. I mean, I still feel like now, 2020, no one really speaks English, though. I think maybe because I also speak Japanese where I don't need to use English, but I think if you used right. English only, I still feel like a lot of people don't speak English. Yeah, they don't. I mean, they kind of forcing people to learn English now that Olympic is coming, but uh, I mean, now do you have the technology, right? I th- I don't think back then you have like those like voice recognition, Google Translate. Yeah, and whatever that one thing is. Yeah, there's that one thing that's really popular. I forgot the name, but you basic. It's like a little t- tiny Tamagotchi that could like translate. Yeah, yeah. something. I like think that. now yeah, they start to launch those kind of things. So yeah, back then you don't have those kind of thing. And yeah, that's basically. So I studied for like a couple of months in Indonesia, and I came here to Japan just like that. <laughs> so you were working okay wait so you're at this language school for a couple months and then um you then came to japan through this language school or you went to another language school so this language school was working with the partnership with another language school in japan okay so they kind of pass you they pass you from their language school to the japanese language school yeah and then yeah. you how long were you at that language school for a year and three months it's a pretty, pretty. That's a pretty intense amount of time to to study Japanese like full time as a student. I would say. Yeah, but even with that time, like, it's not enough for you to even reach N two. It takes some time to reach N two. People usually take like a year and a half or maybe even two. But that's kind of like the course for a Japanese language school, right? Um, you can only choose between six months, six, nine, twelve, a year, a year, three months. So basically, every three months. Okay. So that's kind of like the um courses that you can choose mm-hmm. so yeah i think i started in january and i end in like april the next year and okay. it was like 2000 so i came in 2016 january and then i finished language school in 2017 in april how was that experience would you recommend it to other people oh yeah i think it was um it was a great experience it's just bad too bad that i'm not able to choose what kind of school that is best for my interest? Because at that time, that's the only school available that it was sponsored by this language school that I went to. Right. Right. But there's like hundreds of like language school in Japan that focuses on different skill sets. You know, like, do you want to focus on... You're saying like, for example, like a Japanese language school that focuses more on, uh, for example, the IT industry or the service industry or different industries or... or not about that um it doesn't matter what industry i think it's more about like what kind of japanese skill would you like to learn in a sense like are you only aiming to learn japanese in order to finish n1 Mm -hmm. or are you learning japanese in order to work in japan or are you learning japanese to improve your conversation right the purpose the purpose of what you want to use japanese for yeah because tons of people want to learn Japanese, but they don't want to actually live in Japan or work in Japan. Some people want to learn yes. it to work in Japan and some people want to learn it, you know, for whatever reason it is. There's different kind for of reasons, reason. right? Right. Yeah. If I didn't go to the language school, I mean, a lot of people say this, but I wouldn't be the person I am right now in a sense that most of my a good friend of mine and the reason that I had this a decent career in Japan right now, I think it starts from that. Mm-hmm. So if I were to go to another language school, probably I wouldn't meet this guy right you know um or like this person who actually helped me in finding a job at that time mm-hmm. so i wouldn't regret it 
um, yeah, I, I wouldn't really get it at all. I think it's um, it's pretty exciting because when you are a language student here, it's kind of like you're a high schooler. You don't really have the pressure of like financially speaking. You're not kind of pressured to to reach a certain level at a certain time. You're kind of like at your own pace. Right. Yeah. I mean, like my parents still support me at that time, so. You know, I don't really have to find a part-time job right. um, to, you know, to feed myself. So I can basically just enjoy my time in Japan, mm-hmm. right? It's just like a holiday, but it's just that I just need to go to school every day for three hours and that's it. Right. And the rest of the day, what you do, you just, just walk around Shibuya, walk around Tokyo for like days and days and you just explore stuff, which is so much fun. And then you get to meet people from other country with different stories. Mm-hmm. Um, people. I met friends from Korea, from Russia, from America. And, you know, like you, I feel like language school is really a good way for you to open your mind uh, and to understand not the pain, but different life of peoples. Just only see it. Oh, okay. Um, Maybe around us, we're just basically kind of the same. You know, we have a decent family. Uh, We went through this uh, same school, same area with the same kind of thinking. But if you go to a language school, like you get to meet like different people. For example, like I met this guy who used to be a security in Russia Mm -hmm. and then he worked his ass off off for like five years to be able to come to Japan. Mm -hmm. Right. And then like, I met this guy who's like filthy rich and he was working for like this betting company. And, but he just came to Japan just because he feels like it. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's actually pretty interesting what I always think about. And this is just from my only experience going to. A, you know, I kind of, I didn't really go to a language school in Japan. I went to a, I did a, a you know, multiple exchanges abroad in Japan. And um, I had to take Japanese lesson classes, a part of my program in addition to other classes. So it wasn't like a full-time language student, but I had that language um, school aspect a little bit. And it was just the most interesting thing is that I felt like I became so much more international when I came to Japan than I ever did when I was back in the U.S. Like I felt uh, like I met like so many people from different areas and different. And I think the the coolest part about the whole thing was I met different people from different countries that I've never ever met before. Especially like me coming from like you know, from America, you would imagine we have a pretty international background. But when I came to Japan, I met people from all over the world that I've never met before. I think the coolest part was like communicating in Japanese. Like our our common language of communication was in Japanese. I mean, granted, sometimes we used English, but for the most part, it was like, you know, people from various countries would come together for the purpose of learning Japanese and we would just speak Japanese together. I thought that was like pretty amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Even though your Japanese is still like, like a kindergarten level. You're learning together. <laughs> yeah, you're you learning know? together. Yeah, it's fine. In Japan, you don't literally, you can't expect people to speak English, right? Right. Like people from Korea, from China, they don't really speak English. And then if, if they, if you meet them in Japan, you just have to somehow um, speak Japanese and learn together. Almost every Korean and Chinese I've met in Japan have spoken better Japanese than I have. I think it's just, yeah. I think, I don't know if that's just a me thing, but I'm, I'm also not really of a great student, but. <laughs> like everyone like is like a really good student or like they study really hard and like maybe their mind clicks differently. But so you were at this language school for about a year and a half. Why, why, why did you decide to end there and, and what was your next step? So basically a friend of mine, he found a part-time job in a company called Gogo Nihon. But unfortunately, he found a full-time job in Japan and he would like to stay in Japan longer. So he chose to, he chose this other company, like company A, um, other than Gogo Nihon. And then... But Gogonihan is looking for an Indonesian person to be able to work there. Okay. Um, and so I was introduced and I got a part-time job in Gogonihan. Mm-hmm. So basically what Gogonihan does is that they are a company that helps you to find a language school in Japan, like a Japanese language school in Japan. Okay. So they support you throughout the whole process. So they're basically like a travel agency, but for, for language schools. But for language school, yeah. For specifically Japanese language schools. Only Japanese language school. Yeah, specifically Japanese language school. Um, I think right now they support like college as well. Okay. But most, I think like 80%, 90%, they, um, they work with a lot of like language school in Japan. So basically like you can consult with them, like what kind of um, Japanese 
what's the purpose of you learning Japanese? Right. If you, right. If you feel like you want to improve your conversation, then oh, I think this school yeah. focuses what, more. What maybe they'll also ask like, what's your budget or what area you're thinking about? Yeah. You know, like they're basically like an apartment realtor company, but for yes. for the language school. You know, what's your budget? How long? Where? What purpose? Basically. And yeah. they they just kind of offer you a bunch of places, and then you ju- you then just choose from there. So it doesn't have to be Tokyo. They even support schools in Kobe, Osaka, right. Kyoto, right? As well, depends where you want to live. So yeah, I, I became as like a part time consultant there. Mm-hmm. So they're thinking of expanding name in Indonesia, and they need a person who is able to speak Indonesia. So you know, I can reach out to that students in Indonesia in order to come to Japan. Right. And so, right. So in Gogo Nihon, there's like a lot bunch of like, I feel it's a fun place to work in because literally they have every person from most countries. So for example, like they have like people from German, from France, from Spain, from Mexico, from Korea. If you kind of break it down to the to the bare bones, they're basically regional salespeople to reach out to that region and se- and e- essentially sell their company service to those people. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we do like, uh, we went to our like specific home countries to do like seminars and marketing. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's pretty fun. So I worked there part time until February. Like I'm almost graduating. And then I told them that, hey, if I couldn't find a full time job, I think I'll most likely I'm going to go back to Indonesia. Right. Um, and then I think at the time they decided to hire me as a full time. Okay. So I think I was pretty lucky at that time. Right, right. Yeah. It's not really easy to find a full time job after you graduated from a Japanese language school. Or especially immediately after. Oh, especially I mean, immediately well, after. I mean in your case it was even before you graduated, which is probably even more rare. Right. Yeah. And like in terms of career, I'm still a fresh graduate. Like I don't have any experience working. Some people probably like, let's say if you, if they're like a software engineers for back at their home country and they've been working for four years, they came to Japan, they're in Japanese language school and probably they can work in a Japanese company. But not me. Like I don't have any skills at all. Right. I'm a fresh graduate. I'm still young at the time. I think I was like 25. Right. Yeah. So you, you so, so you started working with them. How long how long did you work with them and and what kind of secret advice or, or kind of like uh, business industry would you give off to some other people who are interested in maybe studying uh, in Japan at a language school? I've, I work in Gogo Nihon um, from 2000, let me see, I think 2016, 18. Um, so I, I left um, my language, I graduated from a language school in 2017, April, and then I worked there for a year until like 2018. Mm-hmm. February, if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, so basically, I mean, like for you guys who is thinking of coming to Japan, uh, first, I think like you can definitely contact them, a bunch of like nice people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then it's really important for you to know your target. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What's your goal in learning Japanese? Mm-hmm. Because I feel like even until now, like my Japanese in that it's not great because I'm not really focused in learning Japanese. If I focus in learning Japanese pretty much by now, I I think like probably my Japanese will be as good. I mean, as long as my English, Mm -hmm. um, even though it's not my native language, but you you need to know what you want to do after you learn Japanese basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you want to stay or do you just want to learn Japanese just for the sake of it? One of the biggest hurdle moving into Japan is that you don't know anyone. I, I'm not trying to say like no country is perfect, including Japan, right? So Japan has a lot of like, I would say scams. If they hurt you, if you're a foreigner, they, maybe they start to, you know, increase the price for the apartment, this kind of stuff. Yeah, that thing happens to me. So right. I was paying like crazy amount for like a small apartment mm-hmm. at Takarunobaba, which is like two stops away from Shinjuku. But to be fair, Takarunobaba is a pretty popular place. Pretty good location, I think. Close to bars, close to social life, close to a lot of language schools over there. You know, I used to I used to go out there and, and party all yeah, the time because right. I, Waseda I was, is close you know, there. Waseda, but so. That's the thing. That's I th- I feel like it's a little bit too loud for you to live there. It's good if you hang out there. 
It doesn't sleep. It's like a con. It's a party like area. Like it's like it's not. It's not. It, but it's not like Shibuya. It's more like a. It's just I don't know what it is, but that that town never sleeps. It's like this. It, you know, they say New York is a city that never sleeps, but Takanano Baba is probably one of the places yeah. that I would say it's like a city that never stops partying. There's always a bar that's open or like a club, yes. you know, or some you know. It's just always active. There's always people there. College students and and you know. Uh, it's mostly just college. Yeah, students, I mean, I like Tarawa, really, but I feel like it's kind of like a mixture of Shinjuku and Shibuya. It's not as crazy as Shinjuku Kabukicho, but it's so yeah, it's, yeah. It has like a good balance. It's it makes a huge difference where you live. Yeah, I think like Gogonihon, um, you know, to have someone to that are able to, con- to be able that you can consult with and also like to know more, to help you prepare coming to Japan makes a huge difference. Especially if you have no idea what you're doing. Because I feel like a lot of people don't have any idea what they're doing. I'm, I was very blessed because I I had some information and I had some people who helped me. And um, I was through a program at my school, so it was, it was a little bit easier. But I think if you want to come to a language yeah. school by yourself, it's really just all by yourself. So it, it is a different kind of challenges in of itself. So how long were you there before you ended up switching to where you are now? I st- stayed there until 2018. March. I lived there for two years. So you moved. So when you moved apartments, that that you also moved jobs, right? Yes, That's why you I moved, moved jobs as well. So how did you make that jump from Gogo Nihon to a recruiting company specifically targeting engineers? You know, a specific kind of yeah. profession. Okay, yeah. this is actually a very interesting story uh, because so when I was in Gogo Nihon, um, one of my colleague left Gogo Nihon and he joined this company. Um, mm-hmm. At the, um, my current company. And so she left. And then after working there for almost a year, I asked myself, like, you know, it's a, good, it's a good job, but there's not much challenge into it. Basically, what you're doing every day is just you meet with students, you reply to their emails, you help them find school, and that's it. And as a career-wise, you know, right. of course, everyone wants to, you know, improve. They want to do something more than that. So I contacted my friend who's working in this like recruitment agency, she just asked me out of the blue, "Hey, why don't you just work here?" <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, wait, wait!" So you, so you, so you had contacted your friend who left the company, who, who was a colleague of yours at, at the time. She left the company, yeah. and then she she left the company for a recruiting company. Yes, and you had asked her for some help on finding a new job, and she recruited you <laughs> into the recruiting company. Into the recruiting company. And the funniest part was that when I joined the company, he left the company. She left the company. <laughs> oh, I was like, no, God. she baited and switched you. She yeah, probably man. like had to like sign <laughs> sign the contract with the devil, and she needed someone to replace her. Yeah, her, <laughs> you know, people has like this negative idea about recruitment industry. You know, like mm-hmm. it's a sales job. You mean particularly in Japan, or particularly, particularly in the world? In Japan and the world, like. I f- uh-huh. um, because like recruiting companies, I feel like what makes it different with a, like a normal sales job is that if you're working a sales job in a like say like a, a company that has their own product, you're just basically selling that product, right? But right. recruitment agency, you're dealing with humans every day. The amount of control that you have, it's not that much comparing to a sales job. I'm not saying a sales job is easier than recruitment. I'm just saying it's different, right? Because you're now con- you're now speaking with human and human mind can change in like a second right so so you're talking to somebody who you're trying to get into this company, this company. and then maybe they decide to change or they don't want to do it anymore yeah. or and there's so much aspect when people change a job mm-hmm. right maybe because of their families what if their wife or their husband says no what if their kid decided to go to a different city you know, those kind of things you can't really control. And so, yeah, people always have like this bad idea about working recruitment. You have to wear suits every day and it's stressful. Is that job. true? Do you, do you wear a suit? Do you wear a suit every day? Do you think your job is stressful? I mean, of course, all jobs are to have stressful yeah, moments, of course, but of course. is it like, is it stressful in general? Do you have to wear a suit every day? What's, not, the, what's, what's it like? Not in my current company. So that's the thing. I feel like that's what makes the huge difference. I'm not saying that wearing suits i feel like wearing suits doesn't really defi- define you as a person right 
Yeah, I think growing up in America, like wearing a suit is only on a special occasion. So for me coming to Japan and if people wear suits every day, to me it almost feels like how can you go higher than that? Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> like in, in, in terms of attire, right? right? Like if you wear like business casual and then when there's like a special occasion, you wear a full blown suit, yeah. then it's like makes it special. But if you're wearing a special, uh, if you're wearing a suit all the time, where do you how do you, how do you go more special than that? They're wearing you know? suit, right? like yeah, you're wearing the full, you're wearing at max level in terms of attire. So I think it's just the culture that Japan has. Like you know, if you walk on the street of like Shinjuku or Shibuya, you're just basically you see like this hundreds of people wearing black suits and they're just walking around. And yeah, and every one of them look exactly the same. Exactly from the, the same from the front and from the back yes. and from the side. Yeah. You, and the stereotypical salary man copy yeah. and pasted. <laughs> and I feel like I don't know, but maybe they're they're okay with that. But I feel like it's sad. I just feel. It's I sad. think it's. I think from a foreigner's perspective, it is a little bit strange. Yeah. I so think it's something strange. maybe that it's hard for us to kind of fully grasp. But for them, it's like, of course, everyone wears suits. Yeah. Like, of course, you know. So moving going into this um, recruiting company first, you know, why did you decide to jump into the recruitment company instead of just saying, you know what, what is there anything else? Why why did you end up just saying yes to this recruit, recruitment company? But also, are your clients Japanese or are they foreigners? Or at that time when I decided to leave the company, um, I ask. I mean, I consult with a couple of my friends who has a longer career than me. So I'm asking them mm-hmm. for like a job search and anything. So basically, like I really, I just really feel like I need to get out of that current job because I'm just not improving at all in terms of my career, um, in terms of my salary, everything. So basically, I just took a leap of faith. I think that's what happened to me since Singapore. Actually, you know, when I came to Japan, I just, I just snapped my finger. I go to Japan. I didn't really think much about it. And somehow things go well. And then same thing when I moved to this current company, I mean, I'm still enjoying it. I'm still working there now um, for, all, mm-hmm. for over two years now. Yeah, I mean, like, I just, they offered me the job and I just took it. I didn't really think much. I mean, of course, I think a lot of things, but, you know, like. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, as tough of a decision as people may think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I just basically, like, I just give it a try. There's nothing to lose. Right. Worst case scenario, mm-hmm. if everything's. Um, if everything went wrong, I'm just gonna go back to Indonesia. That's it. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that mm-hmm. also because like I'm um, going back. Like I told you, like I have a backup plan, right? I feel like my life. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty grateful my life in a sense that um, I have a, you know, my fa- my parents has a job that I can, you know, um, continue if I go back to Indonesia. You know, mm-hmm. I don't really have like my back is not on the wall. If something goes wrong, I can just turn my back and I just walk straight. I can just leave area. You're very, you're very, you're very in a, um, a, in a, you have a parachute. Yeah, that's true. But that's not the case with, uh, with many people actually in Japan. Sure. Yeah. Sure. A lot of people, actually, I respect those kind of people where they just, they throw everything they have and they just decided to come to Japan. Right. You, you, you will meet those kind of people. Yeah. Basically, I just decided to join the recruitment agency and yeah and I, I was like it's not that bad actually like this stereotype that people have for like a recruitment agency in Japan that is stressful you have crazy KPIs I feel like it's just all comes down to the culture and the people you're working with what what is KPI how oh, KPI is a key performance indicator so that's kind of like the target that you need to hit every oh, single okay. week things like that okay. so like your performance mm-hmm. review right so, how many how for lack of a better term how many sales you have to make yeah like how many people you call in a week how many people mm-hmm. you introduce to the company in a quarter or like in a month mm-hmm. those kind of things yeah so mm-hmm. it's quite a stressful job i'm not saying it's not stressful because like they have like crazy targets like you need to hit for example like you mm-hmm. need to call like a hundred people in a week right or you need to send like a hundred email in a day or things like that. Of course, like um, working culture plays a big part. So I feel like I'm not trying to sell my current like my my current company, but uh, <laughs> but most people um, like most of like my management people they came from like those um, traditional recruitment agency in Japan, and they felt the same way. 
So that's the thing that they want to change. Um, you know, like you, is your company an international company? It's an international company. And is it a white white company or black company? I mean, it's a it's a white company, of course. I'm I'm getting okay normally paid. <laughs> so, this kind of stuff. Do you, like like you're not doing crazy overtime or like no, you know, not at all. Your tip your typical black company stuff. Yeah. So that's the thing. When I left Google Nihon, like my ex colleague in Google Nihon was like, "You're crazy, man. You're going to go to in, in equipment industry." You know, they're going to beat your ass. You're going to work your ass off. I was like, okay. And I, after I started for like three months, never have I ever worked more than like after 7 p.m. I don't really work on weekend. You don't have to. As long as you reach your target, you can basically do whatever you want. So if you, so basically if you reach your target in two days, like it doesn't, you, you don't. You're not really working the other days, basically. Yeah. For but, example. Yeah. For example, something that right. For example, like if you reach your target this week, then you know you can just enjoy a weekend. You know. Right. You don't. My. I don't think my boss have ever asked me. Uh, in the middle of the like, it's like, hey, wh- why did you hit your target? You should work now. Or things like that. Is your, are your bosses Japanese? Are your colleagues Japanese? My CEO, he's American, but he's been living in Japan for like I don't know, like almost thirty years, twenty plus. Mm-hmm. So most of, um, I think like my companies, I would say it's very international because they, we, they hired people from all over the world, but most of them are bilingual. So even if they mm-hmm. hire like a Japanese people, um, these Japanese people need to be able to speak English. Is it only English or like, would it be another language is acceptable or is it basically Japanese and English? It's only Japanese and English. Okay. So internally we speak English every day. We need Japanese to just communicate with client. That's it. From basically what you've been telling me since, I guess, since we started recording was that you didn't particularly choose Japan because you had this dying um, desire to come yeah. here or to be here. And, you know, you, you don't necessarily intend on being in Japan in the long run, yep. right? It's just kind of like an experience for you to, like, grow yourself, gain some skills, and you're more than okay with going back. But do you do you see yourself living in Japan or staying in Japan for another five years, ten years? So, what I told myself four years ago is that I want to live in Japan at least until Olympic happen. So I guess that would be next year. Now that would be next year. Now, right? <laughs> or, or never, or never. Yeah, if, who knows, right? You know. yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, I made a promise with a couple of my friends, like, hey. You know, let's stay in Japan together until at least Olympic. But of course, Olympic didn't. I'm not sure if it happens or not, but hopefully it happens next year. But um, so my current plan is, I'm to be honest with you, like I'm not that person who actually knows what I want in the next couple of years, right? So mm-hmm. I think like there's these two type of person where, um, you know, you know what you want. So after this, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to do this and like, you know, I'm going to marry in a certain age, you know, I'm going to have a kid in this certain age, this kind of stuff. And there's also mm-hmm. a type of person where you just go with the flow, right? And I feel like that's fine. You don't have to, you don't have to know what you want to do. The next future. step, right. The right. next step. It's for everyone's mm-hmm. like that. It's impossible. You cannot read the future. But I feel what, uh, what is the most important thing is that commitment. Let's say like somehow you're just in your current state, wherever you are right now, I feel it's really important that you commit in what you're doing, even though you, maybe you don't like it, right? I mean, like when I was a kid, I didn't go to my mom and say like, hey, mom, I want to be a recruiter when I was, uh, when I was, yeah, like, right, when I, was not, right. like, I don't yeah. even know what a recruiter is. Does it even exist? <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, we will never ever think like, hey, mom, I I'm going to live in Japan when I, uh, when I reach 25. So you get, you better be ready in the next, in the next 20 years, I'm going to go to Japan. You don't do that. Yeah. So that's, that's my point. Things go. It's it basically unknown or unknown. to, to be decided to, to be decided. To be, yeah. Yeah. So, but I think most likely um, there's a high chance that I might have to go back to Indonesia um, just because of okay. like, the family reason. Um, because like my, my brother and my sister, they're both married and they live in Singapore now. And basically, mm-hmm. there's no one who's going to take care of my family in Indonesia. So this kind of like so you might have to go back. The struggle that I have in this past few years, like should I? I don't really want to go back, but at the same time, like you know, you have this responsibility as a son 
you know that you have to take care of your family especially that they've 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 treated you so well with what you wanted to do and supported you and yeah things like that and especially as a chinese indonesian like it's in their chinese blood you know like for chinese yeah like there's that you know karma right that crazy rich asians kind of a uh, a responsibility <laughs> uh, feeling. I feel like that. <laughs> a little bit like that. A little I mean, bit not like, like that. Not to that. Not, not like crazy rich Asians, but just maybe just just Asians. I think it's just an, yeah, <laughs> you know? it's just an Asian thing. Like you, you have the yeah. karma. I think everything is goes better karma. Like your family take care of you, and you're you're gonna be like an insulin. You pay it back later. You're basically their their pension. So what about Japan? Do you like what parts of Japan do you really like, and what parts of Japan do you really dislike? Oof. Okay, I wouldn't say so. If you talk about like dislikes, I wouldn't say that there's a certain area or a certain place that I don't like, but it's more of like the culture. The more you, the longer you live in Japan, the longer you'll understand and that Japan is not as beautiful as you think. Yeah. It's a pretty dark. You start to, you start to discover the, the, the ugly side. <laughs> yeah, you start to discover the ugly side of Japan. I feel like it's a, you start to realize they're really like racist and homophobic and sexist and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, like you know, yeah, those kind of stuff. Maybe like there's a reason why Japan is like one of the highest suicidal rate in the world. There's a lot of things that go on that yeah. aren't necessarily all flowers and kittens. Yeah, I mean, like if you go. Just go to the train station normally, and then they say, "Oh, the train's delay. Most likely, someone jump onto the track, right?" And that happens like every month, every week. You don't know, right? So I wouldn't say there's an exact place that I don't like, but it's just that there's just this negative atmosphere that might affect your daily life the longer you live in Japan. I'm not saying that it's、mm-hmm. the same for everyone, but I feel that I felt that、um, the longer you live here, you're going to experience, you're going to go through that. It's just a、uh, An amount of like how much you let that negativity affect your life. What about the parts of Japan that you do like? So the parts of Japan where you're like, I wish I could take this back home with me to my country, or、um, whether that be an abstract object or thing,、okay. or a physical ob-、uh, object, right? Like I know, like a very, like a really terrible example would be like a lot of people want to bring back their kotatsus. Okay. <laughs> like I feel like that's a really weird. That's a that's totally cool. So you give you、yeah. could give an answer like that, or you could even give an answer like that's even more abstract and like, you know, philosophical or what what not. I think like there's this certain thing that makes me feel like I can keep on going living in Japan, and I think it's that discovery. There's an infinite amount of things that you can discover in Japan. That's what I felt. I've been living here for four years, and I. Feel like I haven't explored Tokyo. <laughs> If I live in Singapore for a year, and yeah, they, I fis- there was this there was a study that they had done where they calculated how many stores, how many like cafes and restaurants there are in, in like the、oh, I think、really? the twenty three Tokyo, you know, the twenty three wards of、yep. Tokyo. And if you have gone to each one of them,、uh, a different one, three times a day. You would never ever catch up because they're constantly changing. This concept, yes.、Like、stores are closing and opening, closing, opening, and it even happens in my city. Like when I go down the street, like a store would close and another store would open, and it just changes. It just changes. So even、yeah. on that level, it changes. But even beyond that, you know, there's so many things to do. I feel like it's endless. It's endless here, like man, and and that you're just talking about Tokyo, right? And Japan is not just about Tokyo. I love Kansai. I love going to Osaka. I love. I went. I'm. Went to Kansai like every single year. I just love Kansai,、mm-hmm. right? It's just the food,、yeah. they have great food. But and you have Okinawa and you have Hokkaido, and I've never been to Hiroshima areas. So I feel like there's just that excitement that you cannot bring to Indonesia, Singapore, or anywhere in the world, because Japan is so well built, like in terms of society, that everything is well prepared. For you to explore, so in a sense that they did a good job in promoting different cities, different village, that you know they're growing in terms of that, right?、Um, I feel like in terms of tourism for other country,、um, there's a lot of Japan good- focuses a lot on tourism. Yeah, focuses、like、a lot on tourism. That's like their biggest. That's biggest. That's like a huge. Like what one of if not their biggest industry. Yeah, is that they rely on people coming in, buying stuff, spending money, exploring. That's, tr- that's true.、Um, I mean, especially with the with the virus lately, it's been hit been hit so hard. But 
um you know you know prior to then there was that was their biggest money maker yeah was people coming in buying food buying you know staying at hotels and the whole tour going to industry different places because, yeah. yeah about how you know like you could come to japan a thousand different times and you'll have a thousand different experiences you'll never really have the same experience yeah. and i think yeah a lot of people that's why they come back to japan that's why they like japan so much and living in japan is even even better because it's better. like that every, almost every day I feel like if my friends and my family were in Japan, I wouldn't leave Japan. If they were they were in Japan. That's just the only thing that I feel like I'm missing here. Well, I left I I left America because my friends and family were in America. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh wow. <laughs> that's that's a half uh, joke, you, half serious. That's if, a half joke, if half serious. There's anything you want to say, that. um we can say we can talk after this, you know, like offline. Yeah, we can talk after the show. <laughs> we can talk after the show. Um yeah, kind of we're, we're kind of close to the end of our our podcast here, Marcel. Yep. Um what, what what you know, any last words to 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 our viewers before we end their show? Um one thing that I really want people to know, like um like we discussed before is that Japan is not that perfect right um you know there's a lot of like positivity and negativity happenings in japan but i feel like japan is such a how should it, it's a it's a beautiful country to live in and if you ever have the chance to spend your time more than just being a tourist if you ever had that single like that moment of time that you feel like you know you can come to Japan. I really think that you should. I think like Japan has taught me a lot of things in terms of like managing yourself, taking care of yourself, and it opens your mind. I think it's a very international um, country, even though maybe some people wouldn't agree with me, but that's what I think. Because once you get married, for example, or once you start to have a family, you don't have those advantage. And so I would say advantage. You don't have the chance anymore to explore. Right, right. Japan, you have commitments. You have commitments, right? So, I've seen those happens. Uh, that thing happens to my friend where you know they feel like coming to Japan, but you know they're. I feel like they're missing a lot. Um, you know, for people who has the chance, but they decided to throw it away, coming to Japan. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, like if you ever had the chance, you should definitely, at least you know, um, live here for quite. An amount of time, and I feel like it will change you as a person, especially like if you're Jap, like if you really like Japanese culture, um, it will definitely, you know, it will, it will be good memories for you. Live in Japan. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think coming to Japan changed my life in so many different ways, um, both as a student, as someone who's worked here, as or who is working here, yeah. as someone who's traveled as a tourist, and. And even working in Japan and traveling as a tourist at the same time within Japan is kind of a unique experience yeah. in of itself. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Marcel. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me. And that does it for the first episode of the Why Japan podcast. It was an absolute blast to record and can't wait to get started on my next episode. Again, if you enjoyed it, please share it on your social media and follow our social media and subscribe to whichever podcast platform of your choosing. Thank you again for listening and I hope you tune in to our next episode of the Why Japan podcast with Michael Tang.